welcome to American Catholic History, brought to you by the support of listeners like you. If you value this content, please become a supporter at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Once again, a word of thanks to our supporters. Thank you, everyone, who has supported our work. Yes, thank you sincerely. We're, you know, about 35% of the way to the amount of support we need to really do everything we'd like to do with this content. So if you've enjoyed the episodes, if you've learned something, if you've been inspired or edified, please, please consider becoming a supporter. You can learn about our support tiers at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. The lowest is just $5 each month. But for more each month, you'll get extra perks. Yes. Also, thank you for your very kind reviews and your five-star ratings. Yes, those help others find us. And we really do appreciate hearing ways that our work has helped you when you send us notes as well. Your kids, your students, your parish, however you've been helped by our episodes. Thank you for your notes. Please keep them coming. Yeah. So all that said, on with the show. Today, we're talking about Samuel Sutherland Cooper, one of the strangest figures in early American Catholicism. Yeah, so this was actually a name I ne- I had never seen before, and I only really stumbled upon it while I was working on the St. Elizabeth Ann Seton episode. In the research for that episode, I saw that the land from Mother Seton's school in Emmitsburg, Maryland, was given to her, purchased for her, by somebody named Samuel Sutherland Cooper, and that he was a seminarian at Mount St. Mary's Seminary in Baltimore at the time. Now, that, I mean, that really struck me because what sort of seminarian was this? Who was he? Where did he get the money? How and why did a wealthy man become a seminarian? And what happened to him after that? Well, dear listener, the story is more amazing than, you know, than I imagined. In fact, to set the stage for this episode, Noel will read actually the final lines from a biographical essay that I found about him. The essay ends like this. When he was born in Virginia in 1769, the weakest of all institutions in the British colonies was the Catholic Church. In fact, what Catholicism existed along the Atlantic board was then suffering all the fears and forebodings inherent in the first anti-Catholic campaign in the present United States. At his death in 1843, the church in America had grown beyond the dream of its founders, and when history records the gallant struggles of the pioneers, Carroll, Glitzen, Neal, DeBarth, Flaget, Fenwick, and others, one name can never be omitted from the scroll, that of Samuel Sutherland Cooper, probably the strangest figure in the American priesthood of those early days. Indeed. So let's get right to it because we've got a lot to talk about. Right. Samuel Sutherland Cooper was born at Norfolk, Virginia in 1769. His parents were wealthy and sailing was in the family blood. One of his older half-brothers sailed with John Paul Jones during the American Revolution. The family was Anglican, but Samuel had no real religious upbringing. He was, for a long time, a skeptic on religious matters. Early in his life, he moved to Philadelphia and there grew up among the captains and seafaring folk. He became prominent and by a young age, he owned and captained his own ship. He traveled the world. He did everything. He enjoyed life and grew quite wealthy. But in the early 1800s, he became gravely ill while in Paris and was near death. Suddenly, he had cause to consider the great beyond, all those questions he'd been merely skeptical about. So he took up scripture and began to read. He was intrigued by what he read, but not sufficiently so to change his life completely once he recovered. But his brush with death and exploration of scripture didn't leave him untouched. In 1805, he was in England, where one day he was working alone in his office, and suddenly he felt something like a hand shaking him, and he heard very distinctly the words, Jesus, water, spirit. He was struck by these words. He immediately took them to mean that the religion of Jesus was divine and that he should be baptized. But the question wasn't quite settled because, thanks to Martin Luther and co., there was disagreement about how precisely one should follow Jesus. So he curtailed his English activities and returned to Philadelphia, where he devoted himself to a study of the Gospels and to research into which of the Christian traditions really was the home of Jesus. He studied the principles of every sect and tradition and visited every church to hear them out. 
he began with the Anglican church, the one he'd been nominally raised in. By now, the Anglican branch in America was known as the Episcopal Church. He examined his creed and history and even visited with then Episcopal Bishop of Pennsylvania, William White. But he found the rationale for the Church of England separating from Rome to be lacking. Similarly, he went through the other Protestant churches in town and examined their doctrine, or lack thereof, and asked questions. Eventually, he became convinced that none of them had had good enough reasons for breaking from Rome. So, inevitably, he looked into Catholicism in earnest, culminating in assisting at Mass at St. Augustine's Church one fine Sunday morning. At St. Augustine, Samuel Cooper was inspired by the sermon offered by Father Hurley, but even more significantly, at the moment when Father elevated the host, Cooper heard the words, Jesus is here as unmistakably as when he first heard Jesus, water, spirit. This shocked him. But it also more or less sealed the deal. He wanted to be absolutely sure, however, so he didn't jump up for instruction at once. He didn't want to give in to the emotion of a momentary spiritual experience as ecstatic as it might have been. So the next day he returned to St. Augustine outside of Mass. He knelt at the communion rail and prayed for clarity. But once again, he was shaken by a powerful sense of, here I am. And that was that. He immediately sought Father Hurley and presented himself for instruction in the faith. How perfect is it that a man who had for years found solace and comfort in the world, he should have this major conversion in a church named in honor of St. Augustine. Yeah, and mirroring Augustine's own conversion experience, it started by hearing this disembodied voice speaking a few simple words. In Augustine's case, it was tole lege, which is the Latin for take and read. And the Lord sure works in mysterious ways. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> Oh. And a quick side note about St. Augustine Church in Philadelphia, this church had been completed only in 1801, and it was the largest and grandest Catholic church in Philly at the time. But sadly, you cannot visit it today. St. Augustine would only last until 1844. It was one of two Catholic churches burned to the ground by anti-Catholic rioters. Yeah, you know, we talked about those nativist riots in a previous episode, including the fact that among St. Augustine's founding donors were George Washington and Commodore John Barry, who is the father of the U.S. Navy. We've also done episodes on George Washington's Catholic proclivities, as well as John Barry. Yes, as we've already alluded to, and as you'll see further, Cooper's story intertwines with many other great stories. Yeah. So anyhow, moving on from St. Augustine, Cooper had this conversion experience and was on his way to full communion with the Catholic Church. The whole conversion experience took two years, but in the fall of 1807, Samuel Sutherland Cooper was received into the Catholic Church by Father Hurley at St. Augustine. In August of that year, while Bishop Carroll was in Philadelphia— he was confirmed. His conversion caused quite a stir. He was, after all, a well-regarded, upstanding member of the Episcopal Church. He was wealthy, educated. He moved in high society. This sort of thing just wasn't done. A letter written at the time by another Catholic convert of similar circumstances includes a mention of him. The letter writer wrote, a Mr. Cooper of great intellectual attainments waited a few weeks ago on Bishop White and other clergymen of note, inquiring their reasons of separation from Rome, and finding them as they are was received on the visitation at St. Augustine's Church. He is of family and fortune, and it therefore makes a great noise. The letter writer was none other than Elizabeth Bailey Seaton. Her own conversion story just two years earlier had caused quite a similar sensation in New York City. And their stories would come together in short order. But we're not there yet. Almost, but not quite. Right. So Samuel Sutherland Cooper, still a bachelor at this point and possessed of all the first zeal of a convert, decided that the thing he had to do was, of course, become a priest. Naturally. So he entered St. Mary's Seminary in Baltimore, and again, his friends were aghast. Not just a Catholic, but a priest. Pearls clutched. Some attributed his decision to a bad falling out with a woman. Others thought he'd simply lost his mind. 
(laughs) One old friend who visited him later wrote in part, I was permitted to visit with him and his squalid countenance, disheveled hair, sunken eye, all denoted a deranged intellect. He is newly converted from a merry gentleman of the world to a gloomy disciple of the Roman Catholic Church. Surrounded by theological folios, he began a conversation upon the faculties of the human mind and its aptitude to truth, alleging that its expansion was in the ratio of the magnitude of its object. Having then eternity for its contemplation, it must be in the sublime study of philosophy immeasurably great. Now, (laughs) frankly, all that that paragraph tells me is that the guy visited him during finals week. (laughs) Right. But the account of the visit ends with this humorous rationale for Cooper's conversion and decision to enter seminary. The the friend writes, this gentleman was somewhat celebrated for the possession of a fine person and a set of remarkably fine teeth. He was unhappy in a love affair, took off his boots and walked in his stocking feet in front of the cruel fair one, whether to mortify himself or her is not clearly known. The performance was insufficient at any rate to open a way into her heart. So he broke out his teeth and took orders. Yeah, I'm not sure what to make of that, but I kind of do find it funny. A little strange. (laughs) A little strange, yeah, but funny. And while the particulars of this ill-fated courting are lost to history, it does seem that he had his teeth removed at some point. The reason given in the sources is that he didn't want his very fine teeth to be a cause of sin to others, and some woman had complimented him on them. Right. He was complimented by a woman for his very fine teeth, so he very reasonably, or rather unreasonably, I think, had them removed. Sure. (laughs) Well, he was quite zealous and dedicated. Yeah, he was zealous and dedicated, and there's zeal and dedication, and then there's zeal and dedication. But hey, who knows? Maybe it was good for him. Well, yeah, right. What we do know is one direction his dedication took him that turned out well for all of us was in regard to another woman. Yes, another woman. Another woman. Yes. <laughs> this been, one would been definitely to. not <laughs> this one would definitely not be a cause of sin to him or to her though. We've already referred to this woman a couple of times, Elizabeth Ann Seaton. She was a mother, a widow, and also a recent convert to Catholicism. At the time that Cooper became Catholic and entered seminary in Baltimore, Seaton was living in Baltimore also. She'd moved there from New York after her 1804 conversion to set up a school for girls with the support of Bishop Carroll and Father William de Borg, the rector of St. Mary's Seminary. But Seaton, Carroll, and de Borg all had larger ideas for how Seaton's work should develop. For her part, Seaton had brought her ardent desire to become a religious sister to her spiritual director, who it seems was Father de Borg, multiple times. She and de Borg realized that the French order of the Daughters of Charity could accommodate her children in a way other religious orders could not. But the lack of money made the dream impossible. So they both prayed ardently for a solution to this problem. Seaton came to de Borg one day and said that she had heard very clearly the voice of the Lord telling her to approach Mr. Cooper about her need. He would help her. De Borg listened, but didn't allow her to go see Cooper directly. He said that if the message was truly from God, then Cooper would also hear it and come to them. On the evening of the very same day, Cooper came to see Father de Borg, lamenting that nothing had been done for the education of girls. De Borg, for his part, told Cooper that he'd been thinking about just that project for many years, and that now he even had a woman in mind who would be perfect to lead the project. Cooper asked De Borg, what's preventing you? The wants of means, was De Borg's reply. Oh, I have $10,000 I can give you for this purpose. That's about $239,000 today. Not a bad bit of seed money to start a a small school. Yeah, I'd gladly accept half of that for ours. Goodness. (laughs) I know. I know. Yeah. We're still waiting on that generous donor. Yeah, really. (laughs) Sure. At any rate, Duborg immediately recognized that what he had recommended to Seton had come to pass. Cooper had, in a way, also been poked by God to do something for the education of young girls. After this conversation, the two sat on it for some time so Cooper could have ample time to think it over. At the end of two months, he returned and said that he intended to set up Seton and the new religious order 
just outside of the tiny town of Emmitsburg, Maryland, about 50 miles northwest of Baltimore. Emmitsburg was another providential stroke. Emmitsburg has its own interesting Catholic origin story, which we will tell at a later date, and Father John Dubois had just established Mount St. Mary's as a school for boys and a seminary for the formation of priests a few miles from town. Dubois would play a crucial role in helping Seton to establish St. Joseph's School for Girls just a few miles away. But at that time, Emmitsburg was little more than the place Dubois went to establish his school. It had no other obvious characteristics. So Father Dubois and now Archbishop John Carroll, Baltimore had been made an archdiocese by this point in 1808, were surprised and a bit put out by that selection. They wanted the school closer to Baltimore. But Cooper insisted. Emmitsburg. Out in the beautiful countryside with the mountains, the lovely streams, the cleaner air, he insisted. So DeBorg, probably not wanting to risk losing Cooper's support, acquiesced with a simple, be it Emmitsburg. Yeah, don't look a gift horse in the mouth there, Father. Yeah, really. And so Seton moved to Emmitsburg, where Cooper bought her land, built her a house, and continued for years to support the new Daughters of Charity community with barrels of honey and treacle, figs, prunes, flannel, muslin, and anything else they could want. And his care for the sisters really was more as a loving father than as a benefactor. More than once, he served mass for the sisters while in Emmitsburg, And he never attempted to rule over them or tell them how to go about their business. He only ever laid one obligation on them, and that was to be sure to send sisters to Virginia. Never refuse to send sisters to Virginia, he implored, hoping that these lovely sisters would convert his native land. After helping to stabilize the Daughters of Charity, Cooper took some time to travel Europe, returning to St. Mary's Seminary in 1815. He completed his studies and was ordained a priest by Archbishop Ambrose Marshall on August 15, 1818. Archbishop Carroll had died in 1815, and his successor, Leonard Neal, had only worn the archiepiscopal mitre for 18 months, dying in June of 1817, so Ambrose Marshall was quickly the third Archbishop of Baltimore, just as a quick aside. Anyhow, Father Cooper's first assignment was, surprise, surprise, in Emmitsburg. The Sulpicians had withdrawn their support for Mount St. Mary's, and Father Dubois had left the Sulpicians about that time. Dubois held the title to the land and owned the school, so he continued to run Mount St. Mary's as a seminary and boarding school for boys. But he needed professors and more priests, so Archbishop Marischal sent Cooper. And in just nine months, he made quite an impression, so much so that the saintly Simon Gabriel Brute, I mean, this episode is just a who's who of the early church. Simon Gabriel Brute wrote, O life of the servants of God here below, of poor little souls trying to please him, the hard labors of his Dubois, the mighty desires of his Cooper, the sweet peace of impotence to his Gabriel and his Betsy. Great, great, great Lord, tender Savior. I actually love that he calls Elizabeth Ann Seton Betsy. From Emmitsburg, he was sent far south to a parish in Augusta, Georgia. Here he had a trying time, but also at least one remarkable event. Yes, one of the priests who had preceded him at the parish, a Father Egan, had lost his faith, apostatized, and became quite an outspoken anti-Catholic. The scandal of his fall led to many others losing their faith, so when Father Cooper arrived, he had quite the tough row to hoe. But his zealous preaching and deep faith helped to ease some of the tension. And some of those fallen away began to come back. Well, Father Egan hadn't quite quit the town, and he certainly hadn't quit heaping insults upon the Catholic Church. He even publicly began to attack the doctrine of transubstantiation, that the bread and wine really do change into the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his zeal to defend the Blessed Sacrament, Father Cooper proclaimed publicly and loudly that on the ensuing Sunday, there would be a demonstration to prove the validity of the Catholic belief in the real presence. Almost as soon as he'd uttered the words, he regretted them as rash. For days following, until that Sunday, he wondered if he could somehow retract his boast. But he knew he could not. He prayed earnestly to God to bail him out, to do something great. And then he trusted. So Sunday came. He was intensely nervous. He offered Mass, not sure what to do or what might happen. But he got to that point. 
After pronouncing the words of consecration, genuflecting, and elevating the host over his head and looking up, he let out a cry and he dropped the host. The host had turned into a piece of bleeding flesh. The scandal of Father Egan was broken. And that's amazing. A genuine Eucharistic miracle here on American soil back in 1819. And you never hear about it. Yeah. Father Cooper wasn't at Augusta itself for long. He ministered at multiple parishes in Georgia and South Carolina, and through his zeal, care for souls, and his life of austere and simple living, he won many to Christ. But again, this assignment didn't last. After just two years, trouble in Philadelphia prompted a return to that town where he'd made a name for himself so many years earlier. The trouble was the Hogan Schism. It had to do with a popular priest and troublesome trustees. Trusteeism is a issue that we'll talk about at some point. <laughs> and since the, all of this is also an episode unto itself, we'll defer the details until a later episode. Suffice to say, Cooper had a tremendous effect. The trustees accepted his leadership, Hogan left for Charleston, and the situation was diffused. After Philly, he visited the Holy Land, then came back to minister more in the South, this time in his native Virginia and then North Carolina. Then in 1830 to 31, he was in Philadelphia, again, in, and in Wilmington, Delaware. He really got around, and everywhere he went, he had a great effect on the faith of the people. The final act of his life began in early 1831. His health, after only 13 years of priesthood, had taken a turn, and his strength was failing. An old friend asked him to come stay in his home in Bordeaux, France. The friend was Jean Chevreuse the former Bishop of Boston, by this time the Cardinal Archbishop of Bordeaux. Cooper and Chevreus had been good friends when Chevreus was still in Boston. Yeah, like I said, this Cooper fellow was everywhere and knew everyone. This episode is either like Forrest Gump, or it's like a who's who of the early American church. All we're lacking is a mention of Anthony Coleman. <laughs> well, that is not going to happen. Yeah, no. Father Cooper accepted Cardinal Chevreux's invitation to come to Bordeaux. There, he served as personal confessor to the aging cardinal. Cardinal Chevreux actually died in his arms in 1836. Father Cooper remained in Bordeaux, where his erudition, manners, and personality made him a comfortable person to be with. He aided in the conversion of at least two others who would become prominent American clerics, George Strobel, who would become a pastor of the very important St. Joseph Parish in Philly, and James Frederick Wood, the first Archbishop of Philadelphia. The end came for this largely unknown but incredibly important figure of early American Catholicism on December 16, 1843. His illness was short, a cold developed into pneumonia, and his suffering lasted only a few days. His death was lamented on both sides of the Atlantic. At the time of his death, the formerly wealthy world traveler possessed only a few humble items and about $80. He was buried in the cathedral near his home in France, not far from his friend, Jean Cardinal Chevreus. This has been American Catholic History. If you enjoy American Catholic History, please become a supporter. We've got great perks for supporters. Get information on how to become a supporter and the perks at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. Also on our website, sign up for our newsletter, learn more about Samuel Sutherland Cooper, see about our pilgrimages like our upcoming trip to the Kentucky Holy Land and Bourbon Country, and find other great stories from, from American Catholic History. We also love the great reviews our listeners leave. Those and the five-star ratings help others find us. You can also email us feedback, questions, tips for other episode topics, and other comments at feedback at americancatholichistory.org. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash americancatholichistory, on Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, or follow us on Twitter at ACH1513. I'm Noel Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History, made possible by listeners like you. <laughs>